Hey everybody, welcome to The Community Podcast. I'm Mike Arboit, and on today's show, we have one of the founders of Site B, where the Fountainhead Network has moved to uh, here in Port Moody, Chris Peacock. How's it going, man? Good. Thanks for uh, having me on today. No problem. Uh, obviously, uh, last like what six or so months, we've gotten to know each other a little bit with this partnership that we've uh, agreed upon. Uh, you know, uh, with the Fountainhead Network moving over here to Site B. Um, tell us about your history. Like, how did you get to be here as a guy operating an event space, uh, co-working space, as well as everything else you've done in the last few years? Yeah, for sure. It's a <clears throat> it's a long sorted story. We might need more than a half hour to get through it, but I'll uh, I'll try and chug through it. So. Um, as, as you know, but listeners might not, um, I was part of a, a technology services company called Traction On Demand, um, founded in Port Moody where Site B is in, uh, um, our founder, Greg actually started in his garage in Klahani that moved into a warehouse that is now a parking lot by the train station. Uh, and there were, uh, three, four of us working there. Then we moved into a log cabin on... Clark Street, <clears throat> got to nine people. Then we moved to another building on Clark Street, got to 25, so on and so on, so forth. Um, that was kind of started in, in 2007. I joined in 2010. Greg did it on his own for a while. Um, and then uh, built the company up over the next decade. And in 2022, we sold the company to Salesforce.com. We were a Salesforce partner doing implementation services on their platform. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, our, our number one partner in the platform we worked with acquired the services business that delivered their platform. So, um, And with that, we were kind of at the end of the pandemic. Um, before that came about, we were kind of trying to think during the pandemic of what is the future of work. We had a three-story three office building in Burnaby that when we reopened at the end of the pandemic, you'd go in there and there'd be two or three people and a bunch of tumbleweeds rolling around. And there was just, people just weren't into going back to that centralized location. So we said, what, there's no point A in having the real estate um, for all those people to work in. And uh, if they're not going to be there and what, what could this look like? And so we took, we took a look at kind of like, uh, I, I say the term back to the future. Um, where do we start? When was our culture great? How was it like being scrappy? And we were in a warehouse in, in uh, Port Moody. So we said, what about going back to a warehouse in Port Moody? <laughs> so with that, it was, it was before the acquisition that this kind of idea came about. And the, the plan was for this space to be um, kind of our office space. So hoteling desks, people come in when they wanted to come in. When you need to meet with your team, you had a space to go connecting, collaborating, which was the biggest part of why people wanted to get together. So that's why the lion's share of the space is for having fun, connecting, collaboration um, with with kind of the, the headphones desk space separate from that. Um, yeah, so then when the, when the acquisition went through, then all of a sudden the opportunity came up to shift the business into Salesforce and create more opportunities for more people and, and uh, um, get off a train that was moving a million miles an hour <laughs> down a track. Um, so now we had a space, but no longer had the need to fill it. So we said, well, let's still run the, run the thesis and use it as a co-work space. We have it outfitted and it's ready to go. Um, and then double down on events and, and, and pay for the space by hosting events in it. Uh, yeah. And then, and the, so when we started, <clears throat> we really did the focus on events and the plan was around building a space that was the center of a community, right? We, I use the term community center and a different form of community center. It's not, it's not publicly operated by people who don't have any interest or it's <laughs> just put on their accountability plates to do so. Um, it's operated by people who actually want to create something great in the community. And what that is a place to connect, to collaborate, a clubhouse for the clubs that wouldn't have a clubhouse, a space for associations to meet, a, a space for nonprofits to have events and raise funds, and also a space for organizations that's slightly different to, to host events or have meetings or, um, yeah. And it's, uh, so our first, our first year was, it was interesting. We just kind of, we just kind of opened it up to see where the interest was. Our very first events 
customer was a um was the salsa dance guys yeah uh, they're, they're still with us that once a month, there's uh, 180 salsa dancers in here. Um, and, uh, yeah, they committed early. They loved the space, having the space. It was very different than a gym and a community center or a, a school or a church where they were doing it before. Um, and so they love it. They've been a longstanding, um, uh, customer or community member of ours from the event standpoint. Uh, we had a, a bunch of fundraisers, uh, the biggest one being Love Coro, which is an amazing association. Uh, they had 350 people in here, raised $30,000 for themselves. Um, and uh, the Port Moody Fire Association, we've done a ton with them. We did a blood drive with them. And the goal with events is if we can use, if we can use the, the corporate event or the private event to fund us being able to subsidize the nonprofits and the association events, then that's kind of the perfect model. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so as that grew and all our focus was on events and we had this idea of co-work, we weren't put, pouring any gas on that fire. We, we had limited resources. We weren't marketing it or advertising it at all. Um, and then this uh, a really cool couple <laughs> showed up one day and said, hey, do you want to do you want to chat? Let's let's collaborate. And, um, yeah, I had seen, I had seen TFN come up a few times. I was like super impressed with the marketing and branding and your engagement with, with leads and prospects. Lots of people have talked about what you're doing. So, uh, and then the second I met you guys, it was obvious why it is what it is and why it was what it was. Yeah. We, we, uh, that first meeting we had with you, uh, when we came in here. Uh, I think one of the first things we talked about was just the importance of community. And that when we were on board with each other with that and how this uh, co-working is for that, it, it's, um, I feel like the deal we made with each other that day or like started talking about was a perfect example of what co-working is. It's that, that relationship that's built naturally, but then continues to grow, continues to grow. And these people that, this is what happens here. You see people meeting in the co-working space mm -hmm. and uh, getting along and then all of a sudden working on projects together, even if they, they're from industries that usually don't tie with one another. And there's always people in this space that know how to do something you're looking to try to figure out how to do. That's what I find just amazing. So when we were, the synergies between like both groups and the, and the kind of the irony that we were a co-working event space that really put our, our just like our foot on the gas for co-working because we opened during the pandemic, couldn't do events. So by the time we got rolling in co-working, we were like just going with that. Once we got to being able to do events, we kind of just never pushed them because we never really got momentum yeah. doing. Them. You guys were the opposite. So that synergy of coming together and being able to kind of take both models that both the companies were technically supposed to be, but taking half of it off of each other's plates and just concentrating on what's worked for both of us, I think has yeah. just been absolutely amazing. Yeah, I think, I mean, it was the perfect example of a partnership. I yeah. had something you needed, you had something we needed. And uh, what that was for us, we had the space and we had an idea. And, and the part that was so serendipitous about it all is, you guys had already rolled out kind of what our co-work vision was, which was community, a core space, a place to meet, a place for different organizations to get together. Um, and that was always part of the vision of this, but with just limited resources and where we we're focusing our effort and the, the maximum return we we're getting was on the events. Yeah. So it wasn't flourishing the way we wanted. Yeah. And then you two came in and we sat down and you're like, listen, we we're, we're looking for a different space and we've got, a bunch of members who need a home and you guys seem to have a home and it was just yeah. it was kind of an obvious um the other thing with partnerships is a lot of it is is on gut at the start yeah. it's like it's people it's humans um i i had a great conversation with you guys i totally i mean i got your values right away i got your, your mission and what you were doing from the start and where you were um and it just seemed obvious yeah. um the other thing that that was great is like you were local you were close by so it and and this is maybe for the listeners kind of understanding is is that's what we talked about we're like is this what, what's going to happen if you move locations we're now i mean it's not far but it's a 10 minutes different for people coming from some places mm. and 10 minutes closer for some coming from others but i remember that was part of the conversations what are we going to lose by moving the space 
and it wasn't just location. The other thing is like the the TFN space was it was more corporate. Yeah. If if you have to say there's a spectrum, this is less corporate. Yeah. And a lot of the a lot of the members when they came in, they were like, "Wow, this is different. It's fun." Yeah. And what what we learned and what I really learned attraction on demand is um, the space. Well, the space can be awesome, and I've been in the KPMG offices in downtown Vancouver, and they're beautiful spaces, with super fat rent, and great yeah. views, and and uh, that's one thing. You go in there, but it's not. There's not the culture. There yeah. is the culture. There's a KPMG culture. Attraction. We had this thing, and people always came in, and it was. I kind of I kind of say this in jest. We're always changing something and moving something. So it's like we're constantly under some sort of change or construction or or move but that's never what people saw what people saw when they came in they're like there's a buzz in here yeah and the buzz was the the people collaborating and working together and creativity happening and just even the conversations of two people are having it at a desk and they're they're having fun talking about it or they're engaged in it and the the it was just Culture is built on the people in the space, not necessarily the space. Yeah. Um, and and this is, I mean, this one goes back to to Greg, the traction founder, and and uh, our our uh, primary funder for Site B and Brave, um, which is like when you create it, you create a space for people to be and to connect in that, and they connect, and then they actually make the space. Yeah. Um, which is totally what's happened here. It's been, I mean, it's been so great in the last while coming in just the the life that's going on the the different meetings you hear happening yeah which you don't get you don't get in your own basement right? no and or you don't get it if you're just like one company working under one roof you get at multiple companies and that's where it's that those partnerships you're talking about that happen that like people don't think this industry can work with this industry or this person can help with this mm-hmm. but there's always something that can be worked on together and it's it's just the, the whole idea of co-working and why um, I think it works and why uh, we've this fun air like uh, space has, just succeeds in bringing people in is it's not the traditional office. Why would anybody working from home want to go to the traditional office that they dreaded going to for years and then got the I'll call it an unfortunate blessing uh, during COVID where they get sent home. Um, why would they want to go back to an office space? Uh, it's not fun. This is the perfect balance where you can come in here, be professional, get what you need to get done, but also more of a home vibe, more of a community vibe uh, where it's not like going to work. You like your day's over and half the people hang around for a bit longer. Most places you work, if you work at a physical location for a company, your your bell goes off. It's the end of the day, you're gone. So it's, it's, it's just a different mentality. Um, and I, I actually recently met I think he was was part of the team that was the landlords of your Burnaby offices for traction. Yeah. And he's telling me the things that were planned, like kind of like ideas that Greg would have, like a fire pole between floors yeah. and stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, this yeah. is the, this is just like the kind of fun environment you want to have your team be part of. Nobody works well in that like almost like you don't even need to have people around you, but that corporate office vibe where you feel like somebody's breathing down your neck, watching you at all times. Nobody works well during that. I don't care what people th- like say. If you if you're feel like you're always just get cooped up, the cubicle, it doesn't yeah. doesn't work well. The happier yeah. people are, the better they're going to work. Um, the better they're going to work for you. Yeah, and I think there's there's something about that too. And when you like some of that is just the culture of the business, right? And some are going to be like that. And 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 you put you put people at home or in co work spaces, and it's still the same culture, but now it's virtual. I think something that happened during the pandemic that was really interesting is we started time blocking, right? Like yeah. we were always on Zooms. And I found this when we, when we like kind of at the end of the pandemic going back in the office is we're open up and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go in and see people. I go in, but every single half hour was booked with a Zoom call yeah. from 8.30 to 5. So you go in and you see someone go by and they wave and it's like, hey, I'm on a call. Hey, I'm on a call. Or like, yeah. And so I... I finally realized like you need to block either work times or get a coffee time or yeah. go to washing time, like stuff that you, you never did over this time in the pandemic. Um, but there's so much value in that. There's value to the company and there's value to the individual. And I call them like micro events or um, micro, what, what was the other one I was saying? Kind of like um, micro leadership where 
you might be standing at the microwave waiting for food to heat up and someone comes by and you have a conversation and they give you a tip yeah they tell you something that happened in the company before and it's like hey this this is knowledge you're sharing knowledge you're building culture um i remember i had this at attraction once i'm in the i'm literally in the coffee room waiting for coffee and uh the spell of dave came in and i hadn't seen him for a while we didn't on a day-to-day -day basis work together anymore and i said what are you working on and he tells me what he's working on. I said, hey, there's these guys on the other side of the business doing the same thing for uh, another organization. You should talk to him. And then like 20 minutes later over Slack, I get this message saying, this is crazy. These guys have figured out the problem that we're lit literally trying to figure out. So yeah. this idea of reuse and, and, um, and like happenstance meetings or collaboration or knowledge share that happens in a space um, it's simply different in co-work because there's people who don't work for the same companies. But yeah. standing in the coffee machine here, I'm talking to a fellow and he sold a company to Salesforce in, I think, 2007. Yeah. Before I was even in the Salesforce game. And so we, like, there's a connection there, right? Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, talking to Martin, he runs a uh, franchise and he's a boater and I like boating. So now when we're on the water, we're texting each other and trying to meet up on the water. And yeah. Like, he did some help. He he put lights up on the building for us. And there's just kind of that cool, like everyone's, you don't know what type of meeting you're going to have. Exactly. Um, yes. It can be distracting. If you're, if you're a, if you're a factory and you're looking at productivity and how it's working, it's like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not paying this guy to have a conversation with, with Marty in front of the coffee machine. Yeah. But the value you could be getting out of that yeah. because of something that happened. Not to say it happens every time, value for the organization, but value for the individual is huge. Oh yeah, it's it's amazing. And like uh, it's just if there's if you're having an issue with your company or something or just what you're doing, somebody else has gone through it. Yeah. And usually there's somebody in uh, what we find is there's somebody even the day of that you're bringing up that problem that's gone through whatever you've got you're going yeah. through at that moment and that almost like that like, like just storm in your brain that you can't crack the code somebody does it like that because they've gone through it and they went through what you're going through and had to crack that code all stressed out. And it's just through conversation and it, and it's, I, I literally see it almost every day and I see these relationships build every day and I've seen people like grow in co-working. I've seen people outgrow co-working too, where they have to leave because it's just, it doesn't make sense when you're building a team like traction. Once I had how many staff you said at one point, well, I think at the end we're 12, around 1280, almost 1300 people. Yeah. So like that doesn't work in co-working essentially anymore, but it's, it's just seeing these people from small businesses to startups to uh, companies that are flourishing, that just don't need physical office space you have every like from the start to the like the ending point in business in one one place that has gone through everything and it's it's just yeah it's uh co-working so, means a lot to us we found out in the last few years obviously but we were never really part of the co-working industry beforehand but every every minute of being involved in it you just see why i think it's the future of workspaces yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit on it because yeah. for the for the organization and and looking at it from a company standpoint, um, people who run companies are trying to figure out what is the future of work. Yeah. Everyone is debating. I talked to a gentleman yesterday who's like he's like I I really want all my team back in the office. Yeah. He's like it was so valuable. It's a it's an engineering team, and he's like but if I do that, people are gonna quit. Because 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 yeah. individuals like the hybrid and that version of it, but I do believe culture is made in person. Yeah. Um, I think there is a hybrid where where organizations need to create the space and the time and the way, and that's that's how we ended up in this space. Is this was kind of our version of it, where it's kind of like core, but I mean, this was going to be one company had this space, and different people could go at different times and do different things, but. I think I think companies need to look at this and say like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna instead of paying a hundred and or whatever, 185, 200, 300 dollars um, for each individual a month to have space in an office, I'm gonna create hoteling spaces. I'm gonna free up some budget to then allow people to go and use co work spaces. Yeah. So in a perfect world, I think an organization has a place where people can go to their home and their office where they can host clients and do events and that. 
but they also need to uh, make space for people to work at home, get their heads down, their headphones on, do work un undistracted and get it done. But then there's this third version too of, of allow them to go into environments like this and they're going to get the benefit of it could be a lawyer having a conversation yeah. beside them and they learn something about corporate law that's that, that they can bring back to the business so there is this like it's we're in this time of like of tr like it's a big trust challenge right first yeah. of all the trust of are you working at home and lots of people are saying yes they are i can measure productivity productivity's up but i think it could be higher here the culture might not be the same but but for when it comes to retention and recruitment like, yeah, a work from home is attractive to people, but if someone across the street, if I just work from home and I'm on Zoom all the time, someone across the street offers me 10% more salary, I'm out. Yeah. But I don't have a connection. I don't have the same type of connection. Yeah. So I do think that there's this new this new version, and I do believe a hybrid is for business to make make room, space, budget, and just permission for people to go and work in yeah. more public spaces, workspaces and that. Um, room for people to go home and put their headphones on and put their heads down and get solid work done. And then room for people to get together and whether that's through events or meetings or whatever in their own kind of space that represents them as well. And that that is how these organizations are going to be build culture, right? Yeah, that's like we've built our me memberships around that is not everybody's going to be full time. Um, but there's a lot of people that just need a couple days a week. They just yeah. need to uh, work. They can work from home, but they need to get out, socialize, or just be in this setting because this is good to, to good for the uh, the brain, honestly. Because working from home, I, I've done it for a while before, and it's it's difficult. It's difficult to separate home from yeah. work. It's you look to the right, and there's something that you got to do at home, and it's you find like your workday almost. Uh, to some people, if they're not working as hard, will be shorter. But if uh, for some other people, it's almost like their days elongated because yeah. they're fitting all these little things in, and it's it really you're feeling like you're working all day. So I feel like uh, for parents, especially, we get a lot of parent members that working from home. Uh, yeah, it works sometimes, but not all the time. So being able to come into these spaces um, is is life saving. I know for a lot of our members with with kids, uh, it's it's huge because I tried working at home with with Asher uh, first couple like a little while, like maybe it was a well, year, year and a half. It was almost impossible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I can't do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not good at home when when the family's home. And partially it's because it's distracting and the kids are climbing all over you. And some of it's also that that's what ultimately that's what you always want to be doing. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so the distraction is one. The other one is, is like, we had lots of team members who a couple were both forced to work from home during the pandemic and they're in a studio, a studio or a one bedroom apartment. And they're both on calls all the time. So the noise is there. Um, a, a good friend and member on my, my team, she actually had one of the coolest Zoom spaces because she was flanked by cool sneakers. Her, her husband is a sneaker geek yeah. and had the best sneakers. And everyone's like, where are you? And it's like, I'm actually in the closet. And that's where she had to do her calls. <laughs> and they would alternate because whoever, if they were both having calls at the same time, it's loud. So she was literally going into the closet to do business calls. It was a cool closet. Mine, I could never do that myself. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's this... I think there's this like there's this this obviously the need the space the real estate is a big part of this right yeah. i need a space to go there's the the community need or the need to get out of your house or do something different or work in a different space and that's a little bit more emotional and and mental and then when it comes to the the business like where am i going to be the most productive a lot of these people that work in here are one or two or three person businesses yeah and it's great, like three person business, that's great. You can get together and you don't have to carry a, a, a long term lease and you can you can use resources and, and worries not on real estate, but more on focusing on the business. Um, but this this idea of like of businesses thinking that way, what is the real estate plan? What is the real estate strategy? Yeah. And 
what am I going to do with that space? The other thing that was like a big driver for us um, is this idea of idle assets. So you have an office space at nine to five, there's people in it, and then it clears out and five to nine, it's empty. Weekends, it's empty. The odd person might come in. So if you create an event that, or a, a space that can be events on the weekends or events in the evenings and co-work during the daytime, you're now getting more value out of that space and that real estate. And now we're in a time like when you talk about environmental, like having a big empty space that is empty, what, 60% of the day because no one's in it. It's just not, it's not a good use of space. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, let's make the most out of the space. But with that, it comes with, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes there's a market setting up on a Friday afternoon when people are working on calls. But that's the one thing that's been really awesome with the community members is they're really open to it. Yeah. Uh, On Sunday, it was a rainy Sunday. We decided to like open the space up to kids. We set up some games and toys and put some movies on the thing and came in and and there was a gentleman working and I felt bad. We didn't realize it was blasting the floor is lava. (laughs) And uh, he's like, yeah, can you turn it down a bit? But but at the same time, understanding. And I think like you might have talked to him yeah, yeah. on Monday and he's like, you know what? Like, it's pretty cool. I'd rather be a part of a space that sometimes there's noisy kids running around yeah. than, uh, than the alternative, which is, and I mean, we're in the WeWork space, right? And yeah. I, I spent a lot of time in those environments and they were, they were kind of trying to do this, but from a real estate first, not a community first. Yeah. Right? And so they all became the same. It just, it felt like a Starbucks. No one was talking to each other. No one's collaborating. Yes, there's free coffee there. More and more people were pushing for closed offices in those spaces. So the open open plan WeWork spaces ended up just being a whole bunch of private offices. So yeah. it's a shorter term lease. So I think that was a big, a big part of it. It's like, yes, the idea of community is there, but that was, again, real estate forward or real estate first. And this one's about, community first yeah and with that again it comes some it comes some compromise for event people and there might be someone working on a desk upstairs in their event and it comes compromise for the co-workers when people are setting up for for an event but so far i think the feedback's been great yeah I think membership for you guys has stayed pretty much yeah it's pretty it's uh it seems like it for anybody that like coming this far out uh, was a problem for we gained back by somebody else uh our our crew of like, like uh, people have been here since almost the beginning, still mo- like the only way we ever lose them is if they move away. Yeah. It's uh, the community first um, aspect. Yeah. Uh, first few years is tough building a community during the pandemic, but, but we knew that's what you had to do to make uh, co-working work. Um, the, the, there was a lot of places like even the WeWork, WeWork started off right, but they call it co-working, but really what it is is office leasing. There's, it's uh, it's a totally different vibe. Reed just can say this. It's the same thing. It's it's uh, it's somebody leasing an office from you. Uh, it's not co-working. Co-working is literally that word. It's working with others. Um, and it just the, the community aspect is huge. The fun aspect is huge. Where we're sitting right now, like this isn't our usual podcast studio. This alone makes our, our, our office different our co-working space different uh uh, airstream in the middle of the warehouse being used as a meeting room in a podcast studio not your typical office setting but a lot of people dig it It, we've been since we moved in being used as a meeting room pretty frequently when it's here um but there's a lot of history in this thing right yeah this this is a interesting one so this um this airstream was actually in in some of that same uh mission and value uh when we had an office on clark street we outgrew the office we got so many people that we ended up meeting spaces became desk spaces and there was no place for someone to sit down or three or four people to sit down um and so this was a a brainchild of greg's and he found this old rotted out airstream and said let's turn this into a meeting room so we put it in front of the office converted it into the meeting space you see today um and it solved the it solved the challenge and a problem we had at the time which is we needed meeting space but we didn't have any more real estate inside the building so this <laughs> this is the way to do it then we now again idle assets we have an asset how can we use this where well, we could actually take it to on site to customers spaces and bring them and immerse them in our environment and our culture and get them out of their day to day we did it well, i mean business consulting and 
technology consulting was the, the core of our business. So to pull up in front of someone's office and say, meet in our space, but you don't have to commute to our space, just come down and get, get out of your normal day to day so we can really get into the meat of what we're trying to do together. Um, and then as well for events, we took it down to San Francisco every year. And then the, 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 there was a, there's a conference called Dreamforce we went to every year as track as, as traction on demand. And it was a big conference for us. And, uh, the very first time we went down there as a team, Greg said to everyone, all right, guys, we can, two of us can fly down there and stay in hotel rooms and go to this conference or economically we could all drive down there and stay in an Airbnb. What do you want to do? And yeah. everyone said road trip, like the first thing that came up. And so instead of two people going to this conference, there's now 12 people going to it, um, which huge value to the team, to the culture, spending time together on the road. Um, and then the next thing was, well, if we're going to be driving down there, what could, what could we do on the way? Well, we can just stop in every town and party, which we did, but we're like, well, wait a sec. If we did, if we did some work and some pro bono work for nonprofits along the way, and then we could actually, as I was mentioning with locally, take the Airstream to their office, pull up in front of their, their space or their place and invite them into our, into our environment. So what we did is we would do, we would, there, there's a whole process to get nonprofits on board who are trying to, um, trying to transform their businesses with technology. Um, we would kind of set up and do the, the, I'll say that like the development type of work and the configuration type of work they needed done. And then we would roll into town, roll up to their office and do the training and rollout in our space. <laughs> and then we would do lots of nonprofit events or sorry, some kind of like team building culture events. We walked dogs, we cleaned up the, uh, the, the beaches and pulled um, invasive species. We did garbage pickup and Coos Bay. And so it became a thing and a cultural thing. And as a marketer, um, my my kind of philosophy has always been spend your money creating a story that people want to tell versus spending your money telling a story that people may not want to hear. <laughs> Very true. And with that, it's like, yeah, let's put the marketing budget into this road trip, into uh, creating the story, into doing work and giving what we're good at to nonprofits. And that will be enough of a story that people will tell it instead of crafting some creative kitschy concept and then buying media or buying eyeballs to look at this or ears to, to listen to it. Mm. Um, and so it was a, it was a really effective way of bringing together doing good, building culture and building team, uh, giving back, giving what you're good at and, uh, and having fun. Well, obviously work as traction became just like you said, the growth was exponential. It was just a million miles per minute. Right. So the outside of the box thinking definitely helped. Everybody thinks that just throwing your money into just blindly marketing stuff works, but sometimes it does, but most of the time it's what you're building from the ground up and just, uh, creativity is, is massive. If you're the first to do something a certain way, that can create a revolution, right? That can create something where more and more companies go that route. Yeah, I think there's, there is a, um, I'd say like one of the biggest challenges I hear from business leaders, and this is in, in communities like EO and YPO, there's all these business communities where, like you said, people come together and they've had the same problems before and they're discussing the same thing. So in some of these spaces and environments, like one of the biggest challenges right now is retention culture burnout people and it's like and and we're in this time where people need to start rethinking culture now one thing that that we always did and and it's like okay there's such a drive in new business and entrepreneurial businesses to sell make money get the revenue in. businesses get to a certain size and they get to certain success and then they can take a breath and say okay now now what are we doing around the community how are we giving back so I'm now making this much money. I got to give a percentage of it back. And so then they hire and create corporate social responsibility teams and do this. But if you weave these things together, so your marketing, your services or product, whatever you do, um, and your HR and your culture and bringing it together, there's ways you can do, like I mentioned with the, the bandit tour, where you can tick all boxes at the same time. Yeah. And you can use marketing budget to, to build culture. And you can use HR budget to help 
create marketing stories and you can use uh, sales and marketing budget to, to, to do both. And so it's a different economics. I'm, I'm a, like, like I'll say, I'm not, I want to say cheap, but it's not cheap. It's value. I want to get the most value out of the, out of the dollar you're spending. So mm -hmm. if you can do that and tick more boxes, um, it can be more valuable. Yeah. And it's the same thing. We're, uh, um, uh, attraction we were a b corp we became a b corp it's a hard thing to become a b corp mm -hmm. uh, you gotta you gotta i mean there's a lot of i'm gonna say paperwork but it's not there's a lot of like compliance stuff you you need to pull together to be able to assess your business on where it stands mm -hmm. in their in their um kind of ranking system mm -hmm. and then every two years you got to go through it again and it's really easy it's kind of like fitness when you're a small company or one person, it's great because all the questions can be answered by one person. Yeah. If you're a big company and you're going for your E Corp, you now need to get finance, HR, people, sales, like all, all different stakeholders in the room to do it. Yeah. But if you do it early, it's easy to do. And then kind of, it just, you just weave it into part of who you are. Yeah. But we did that from like a responsibility standpoint. It's a good thing. Like, like, who do you want to, who do you want to align to? You want to align to companies like, Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's and like like the the organizations that are doing things right and if you can say you're part of that it can be a benefit and now what we learned with that is all of a sudden we're a B Corp and I look down the list of B Corps I'm like these are all the people we want as customers if these are the people we want in our community why wouldn't we have them as customers no. so I start picking up the phone and ring and my 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 favorite one was Patagonia I'm a big Patagonia fan of the business mm -hmm. and Yvonne Schrenard and everything he's ever done um and I chase them. I call it the the 1,066 day sales cycle from the day I created the lead in Salesforce to the first time we signed a contract to do work for them. Yeah. And the first call is just, hey, we're a B Corp. I know you guys are a Salesforce customer because we're a partner and they said, you have some Salesforce product. Can we work together? And chased them and poked them and saw them at events and met with them. And finally the phone rang and they're like, yeah, we're ready to, we're ready to do something. We need a partner. Um, you guys are the obvious. You've been very persistent, um, but you've also proven yourself with aligned values by the nature of the fact you're a B Corp. Yeah. So there was something we did for one reason, but the side benefit was huge. It became a big part of marketing. We didn't have it. We didn't have a sales deck or a sales cycle where you did not have the stamp on there. Yeah. And more often, you had to explain to people what B Corp was mm -hmm. than explain to to than talking to someone who knew what it was. But just in doing that, it helps. It helps describe and define your values as an organization. Someone's like, what's B Corp? Well, it's a group of companies that agree to certain standards and measure and rank themselves on a, on a biannual basis. And you have to keep your points up to, to maintain your certification. Oh, and companies like Patagonia are in that group. And yeah. so it's, it's just another validation point. It's not the reason someone's going to work with you in your business, but it's definite validation point of like what community are you in what circles do you hang in what who are your customers who are your partners who are your people in your team yeah and i think co-work is kind of a piece of that too it's like what do you do where do you work it's it's interesting when you're on a call and someone's like where are you yeah and it's like i'm in this co-work space and i pick my laptop up yeah. and it's events and it's events on the weekends and in the evening they're like that's cool i'm either in my basement or in my cubicle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been, it's, it's uh, going back to my point of like, like every business is trying to figure that out. Yeah. How do I, how do I build culture? How do I retain people? How do I recruit people? What kind of environment do I want to create? And you don't have to own that environment from whether it's a lease or own. It doesn't have to be this control scenario of everything has to happen in my space. You have to give people the freedom to work on their own, to work in other environments. You have to have the trust of like, hey, yeah, what if they're in a cord space and a competitor poaches them? Yeah. Or find other reasons for someone to like find other other reasons and ways to retain your people other than just keeping them away from the competition. Yeah. Create an environment where people don't want to go anywhere else and actually it becomes more of a recruitment opportunity than a retention opportunity for you. You want people like money's always nice, but you want people to be loyal for the the reasons of like loving what they're doing and loving their company than um, loyal because you just pay them a lot of money. Yeah, that's because uh, somebody else can come and pay them more money, and it, it's if that's what it's about for them. Um, you're never gonna keep those people around, right? Like those people will always move on, but 
if you create a culture around what you're doing and um, it, it, oh, if people are happy, it's not always about the end dollar. It's more about, are they happy with their lives? That, that's the biggest thing. We saw that in the, in the pandemic and the pendulum swung where it did become about the dollar because yeah. you couldn't create culture and you, you took a new job and you're in your house and whether you were subscribed to the product or the team or a little bit of the virtual culture you got, it was that it was that same scenario where I said if if someone else calls me and offers me ten percent more, twenty percent more during pandemic, we saw people getting offers of fifty to a hundred percent more than they were making. Yeah. So of course they're gonna leave. And they came like sad, like, hey, I love this business, I love everything we're doing, but they're gonna pay me twice as much across the street. But then the pendulum swung back where times get tougher and and some of the first people to get let go are the ones that's like, wait a sec, we got unnaturally high wages because of the scenario we're in. Yeah. So this correction means this massive layoff, right? There, yeah. there, there was first a great reset or great resignation, but then there was a great layoff where, <laughs> where it's not economically viable for a business to pay certain people that level when they're only charging this level. Yeah. Right. So, so there's a bit of a correction there. Um, but the other point on the, on the, on the money thing, it's like, I think it's like number six or number seven on why people work for a business. Yeah. People think like, yes, it's number one and it's, it's great if it's great, but people want to work for a company with purpose, with vision, with culture, with team, with opportunity, yeah. with recognition. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a it's a huge factor for yeah, sure. Yeah. And when it's when the offer comes across the table for fifty percent more, sometimes that is a factor. People are like I'm going to a company with a product that I don't believe in half as much as this, but I'm doing it for that. And then you get a different kind of uh, of unhappiness or or lack of fulfillment when you're on that side. And it's really tough now. You've changed your lifestyle. You've become uh, accustomed to to making a certain amount. Yeah. So it's really hard to take a step back or a step over, moving back into something that's a build versus a growth, growth state. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so a ton of that. Well, that's like, uh, my next question is like, what, like, obviously we work here at like TFN site B together, mm -hmm. but you're always on the go. Like I just always, whenever I walk by, you got something going on, whether meetings or just like always just go, go, go. What's next for you? What are you, what are you doing right now? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question. And, I think with this business and, and um, like this business is running and the, the, the vision is coming to life, the right players are, are in place um, and probably the least valuable thing I can be doing is operations in this business, right? <laughs> there's, either, there's, there's either ways of getting stuff done that it doesn't have to be me doing it everything from garbage sweeping the floors although i love doing that stuff <laughs> I was a bathroom fan the other day like that's that's where i do a lot of my thinking and a lot of my creativity is is puttering and so mm. i've had a lot of people say like really you're the one who changes the light bulb and you're the one mopping the floors it's like yeah like like part of it is um feeling that ownership and that piece of it but it's more so it's like it's my way of thinking and doing yeah um, but that said, I work, I work with a technology company that was, was spun out of the, the traction family. So I'm helping them with some go to market and some business development and some alliances stuff. So getting back into like, like doing what I'm, I, what, what my career was and what I was born to do, yeah. which was maybe not running a co-work and event space. And that's not where I'm best spent running yeah. a co-work and event space maybe building it getting it off the ground and like making the connections with people like yourselves to say hey this is the best way to execute our vision yeah. it's it's to plug in with someone who is aligned values model working model needs and do that um so the best thing i can do is get the heck out of the way and let you guys grow right yeah um yeah, and then and then the brewery. I mean, we didn't talk much about the brewery. Yeah. One of the visions for this space as well was this was there was also going to be a brewery in here because because beer was always part of our culture attraction. We bought the gear and we were ready to go and build out a brewery in here. And then one came for sale up the street and they already had a tasting room and a license. So it was like, hey, we could we could take that over and be 
be brewing a year faster than we could if we built it out ourselves. Yeah. So now it's kind of like one one building in two buildings, if you will, yeah, one yeah. business in two buildings. Um, but part of our sister company, and we can, I mean, we can we can drive revenue and drive the brand and that through events that are happening here for Brave. And the same thing with Brave when they have events that are that are bigger than they can handle or they need a different type of space, they, they can work off the events here. Um, so yeah, so those are, that's kind of the, the family of companies, but I'm right now I'm moving from like a investor operator to mm -hmm. just an investor. And like I said, I want to get, get out of the way of you guys who are looking to grow, build a great business, build a great community. I'll be a part of that community. I'm yeah. still going to be working from that desk right there. Um, but yeah, let the, let the, create the opportunities and the space for people to bring their own their own contribution to what this big vision is. Yeah, we I know we didn't talk about the brewery much, but it's it's we've talked about it before how uh, it's a lot co-working and breweries are a lot alike in the way of of just the community aspect what separates a brewery from a pub uh, or even a, or a club or like just more so of like people go to a, a brewery and it's more of a community and uh just the camaraderie vibe where everybody wants to get along it's that old cheers like everybody knows your name type thing right it's just they they kind of align very similarly well part of uh yeah and actually one thing we did at the opening i didn't tell this part of the story but at the opening of the i said the opening of the pandemic but the closing of the pandemic but the, the reopening of the world um, when we did open the doors in our office space and there was no one in there, we started kind of like digging in, like, why aren't people coming? It's like, oh, they don't necessarily want to commute or they come in and there's not enough people in there and there's not enough buzz or vibe. So we're like, okay, so smaller spaces would be better, right? Cause you need less people to get that buzz. Um, but then we're like, then locality of that, where is that? And what, what makes sense? So we ended up partnering with a bunch of breweries. So there's Patina. Tina and Poco, House of Funk in North Van, Brew House in East Van, Container Brewing. And all these breweries we just talked to them, we're like, hey, you guys have a space. You have a tasting room that's empty during the day with people crafting beer in the back. Like, we've got a whole bunch of people that need a place to work and go and want to get together, but they don't necessarily want to drive to an office. Like, can our people work out of your space during the day? Yeah. And all of them were like, absolutely. And, and like, okay, so what's the give and take here? We had some agreements where we just buy lunch for everyone who's in that space that day. And so that was a, that was a draw for people to go to Patina because if they went there, Traction would buy them lunch at Patina that day. Yeah. But if you wanted to get, if you either wanted to get out of your basement, we built a really simple app where you go on, you could see all the different breweries. You could see who was working the brewery what day. So if it's Monday, I'm like, I need to get out of the house this week who's where this week I could look and I'd be like, Oh, look, Dave's working at Patina. I might, I might go there on Thursday and I'll send Dave a slack and see if he wants to have lunch or I need to get together with my team. Hey guys, let's pick a, pick a brewery. Let's go to house of funk. We'll book eight of the spaces there and all eight of us will go work out of there. And so what we, what we found in that, it's like when you're sitting there and you're being creative and craft and problem solving on a laptop with a mouse, and there's also people being creative and craft and, and bringing something that's like a, a tangible good. There was lots of like crossover there and the, the team loved being around that where some of that was being created. Tap rooms are generally cool spaces and they like working in those environments. The breweries loved it because like, hey, this is cool. Someone's in our space. It looks, it's, and generally our demographic. You've got, you've got young technology people who, who like to drink beer. So they started, it was good for them. It built a bit of culture and community for them. It's good for our teams. It, it gave them a space to work as well as kind of like immerse them in this, in this space. Um, and so that was another thing too. And it's like, is the future of work? Like why not have a brewery in our, in the middle of our office, right? Yeah. Instead of having our office in the middle of a brewery, why not put a brewery in the side of our office? Yeah. So that was, that was kind of part of the, the thought process in there. Yeah, it's it's a brilliant idea, and I think it with little uh, events, not even events, but like weekly things like beer clock, uh, just bring like more. Even though that community is together all day, having that like official time and day where everybody comes downstairs that's still around and ha has a drink together, and even if they don't drink, just like chills and hangs out with one another. Uh, it goes back to what I said. It's it's not the typical workspace where you 
your day's over, you go home. There's a lot of people that stay here for, for a few hours longer than they need to just to be around the community. And I honestly could talk to you, I feel like, for forever. Uh, I'd love to do a part two because I feel like there's so much uh, to learn about you. I know you told me about your history, like even like I think you fixed, what, helicopters, was it? Or Yeah, I started uh, out of school. I was a helicopter engineer and, yeah. and made the natural transition into marketing and advertising <laughs> and cassette and then the natural transition into technology or unnatural. Yeah, it's that. like it's everything. It seems like you're covering all grounds. Well, actually, and when you think about it, when you think about the people in this space, and, and this is the only advice I give a young person today is like, always keep your head up. Every conversation you have could be an opportunity. And yeah. Very much so it was. Like the, the very first time I met Greg through another person I used to work with and we talked about wakeboarding and then he's like, yeah, I want to get more into it. And next thing we're friends and 10 years later, I'm quitting my job at a big company to go work in a garage with him. And it's it's just like, like keep your head up. You might not understand what the opportunity is at the time, but if you're open enough to think of everything could be an opportunity, you're just more open. Yeah. Yeah, you never know who you're meeting. You never know uh, what relationship you're building. Um, just take those opportunities. Like it's uh, and they got to stop teaching kids to figure out what they're doing at 18 years old. Like it's I, I'm like 36 years old and I have no idea what I want to do. What do you want to be when you grow up, Mike? Uh, I, I, I want to be a pro wrestler. <laughs> well, you're on track. Okay? I mean, I technically am one. I'm just not a very high-paid pro wrestler. But it's uh, that's always been my dream. But it's always I, I feel like that's the entrepreneur in me. It's uh, it's like growth. I always want to. Once I get comfortable somewhere, it's like I want to do more. So it's it's usually like what can I add on top of this that kind of will. Um, what it's just like will help out this pass or help out what I'm doing here, but let's do it differently with something else I've learned. So that's just constant evolution. That's really as a person, but as uh, even when it comes to careers, it's uh, just learning from everything in life and putting it into um, fruition, really, and uh, taking all of your life experiences, uh, taking it in and actually like, actually thinking about what's happening around you and why it's happening. Um, uh, like, like say everything happens for a reason, but I, and, and like manifestation, like people can believe it's real, not real, whatever, but really it's that positivity and just that constant change. If you're, if you're okay with change, uh, like what happened with our, with our partnership here, if you told me in October, like, uh, give me a few months and my, uh, shit and bricks feeling will go away when it comes to like what with this business we built uh what's going to happen to it what's going to happen in the community uh and then you give it just one meeting and then uh see what happens now this is like it's meant to be like that that shit storm we were in for for a long period of time it's stressing our stressing our asses off uh turn into something what it what was actually uh meant to be good thing yeah and you kind of had to you had to go through that yeah. Whether it was the time, yeah. the timing, or or the path that kind of brought it together, for our business to be at the state it was when your business was at the state, like their I say serendipity or fate, yeah. if you will, on on what was supposed to happen. But it's been a and then who would have thought you'd be hosting a wrestling event in <laughs> yeah. the office a few yeah. months later? But um, yeah, it's been a it's been a total pleasure getting to know you guys and and work with you guys, like from a work standpoint, but also like. That's the other thing, getting to understand like this passion for wrestling and then being able to pull something together and make that make sense and work. And it was yeah. a benefit. It was a business benefit to all of us. You're doing something you love doing, you're passionate about. Huge for the community. The feedback on that one's been awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just none of that comes together over Zoom. No, none of it. Yeah. None of it. Absolutely. I, I have kind of gotten to a point where i like i don't want zoom interviews ever like i rarely i this podcast even since during the pandemic i really rarely wanted to do do zoom podcasts i feel like they're soulless i feel like they're just they're they're not you could be having the exact same conversation but it just doesn't feel the same it's um this it just all goes back to community and just that that camaraderie and that that realness that is people working alongside of one another having real conversations uh no facade it's them um not wearing a button-up tie and then sweatpants underneath because you're just only seeing this from 
from like every day. So like, no, it's like you see the real people here. I don't dress up. A lot of people that are in co-working, you don't see them coming in suit and ties because it's not that vibe. But they could if they wanted to. It's just you I got. I would say there is some. There's yeah. some people who dress very well when they come in here every yeah. day, and and sometimes I feel like ah, I should probably dress up. But yeah. you know, there's a time and a place. Aaron always tells me that <laughs> <laughs> she wishes that I would, but it will never happen. Nah, uh, like I said, it's it's sometimes sometimes dressing up is a, a show of respect, and you wanna you wanna align yourself to where you're going. <clears throat> if you go downtown to a meeting with a bunch of accountants, you're probably gonna try and try and dress and accommodate and assimilate to what they are. But the purpose of that meeting is not for them to understand the real you. It's probably a financial conversation. Yeah, I thought it was that. And it was very ironic and it seemed like it was meant to be when we found out we had a kid the same age, uh, same had name. the same name. <laughs> and it's not like it's Mike, it's not named Mike. It's not like Chris or Mike. It's, it's a pretty unique name. So when it was like, uh, oh yeah, how old uh, your kids? Uh, oh, this and this is their name. It's like, well, holy crap, that's pretty ironic. <laughs> a couple of a couple of Ashers, and uh, they become friends, and it's just yeah, it's part of it. it's, it's cool. So. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I, I appreciate this. Um, obviously, there's just going to be more and more growth with our relationship, the businesses' re relationships with one another, and I'm, like so excited and just so thankful for this. It's been like uh, time's flying. By the way, I feel like this year has just flown since we've been here, but it just every day seems to be like it just is going in the right direction. Everything is just perfectly matching together. So I appreciate it, man. I cool. thank you so much for being on the show today. Look, look forward to, to being, being intertwined with you guys. Life, work, space. Yeah, well, it's been great. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. And thank you all for watching today. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel, as well as just let us know what you think of this uh, podcast. We love hearing feedback. Um, but yes, subscribe, like, and thank you for watching today. Have a good one. Thanks, man. Thanks, man.